so glad that you've joined us today and I appreciate your faithfulness to come out. God's doing some amazing things here uh, in this house and uh, I want you to be a part of all of it. So pay close attention to everything when we make announcements or things like that. It is really important that uh, you connect with those things, put them in your phone because sometimes when we have something on Saturday and you heard it on the Sunday before, you don't remember that something's going on on Saturday. Is that true? So you got to put it in your phone, do something uh, like that, that uh, uh, you can remember what's going on. Amen? Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles and go to Psalm 133. We are continuing our discussion on racial unity. And a lot of what we are uh, talking about, we have based out of a book and simulcast that we did a week ago Saturday uh, entitled, it was, the simulcast was Race for Unity, uh, based on the book, The Third Option, by Pastor Miles McPherson, who's a pastor of the Rock Church out in San Diego, and he has given us some great tools that we can use to help bring unity into our city and into the church and really our nation. And, and it is true that we need it now as much as ever because I think that it is, it's important that we address these things, uh, that we talk about them. We don't back down from them. I got a lot of positive feedback uh, last Sunday after uh, Brother Ken and I spoke, uh, and then also after the simulcast as well. Uh, that we had on Saturday. It's just important that you understand, before I read the scripture, that what we're talking about in terms of racial unity, it is part of the DNA of this church. It is who we are, amen? It it is, and and addressing things that are uncomfortable sometimes and and recognizing, hey, these these are tough conversations to have sometimes, but as we learned from the simulcast, that it's, it's good to sit in small groups, and that's part of the takeaway, that this isn't the end-all to end-all. Next Sunday, we, you know, we're going to do a panel discussion. It won't be the end-all. It's got to be that you take <coughs> what we are talking about here and then have the freedom to go sit in some small groups, get with your friends, uh, talk to people who don't look like you and have open and honest conversations. And I believe, and and people say, well, you know, that's uncomfortable. If we can't fix it in the church, we don't have a hope of fixing it out there. Amen. That's, that's reality that, and, and so 
I, and I think the problem is the church has backed off from talking about these things. And uh, as Ken said last week, that 11 o'clock on Sundays is called the most segregated hour in our country. Well, that shouldn't be, right? That shouldn't be. And Trinity, we have been a church for 47 years, and that we are called to be different. We are called to be set differently than everybody else. Amen? Amen. So that's important that, that we talk about these things. We are a mature church. Uh, we, are, we, we don't have to shy away from things. We're not going anywhere. I've told you uh, for years that we're stable. We're, you know, we're not fly by night. You don't have to wonder what, what we're doing or all of those you know, things. Are they going to be here next week? No, this is, this is who we are. And it's part of our DNA and part of our destiny. Psalm 133 says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. You know what's good? Unity. You know what's pleasant? Unity. That when we dwell together in unity, here's what he said. It is like the precious oil, talking about the anointing oil, upon the beard, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, which represents the priesthood. So it's like it has an anointing on it when there's unity, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. Zion represents the church in the Old Testament. So it's like a fresh rain coming upon the church when we walk in unity, when we get along, when, when we are united, and I'm going to talk about what we're united around, uh, that it's important for when there's unity for there. Where there's unity, verse 3 says, there. Everybody say there. He's talking about where there's unity. So there, the Lord commanded the blessing, and he commanded life forevermore. So when we have unity, we get blessed. Yeah. Amen? When we make a decision that we are going to live a life of unity, we get blessed in that place. When we become a house or a people that are trying not to have unity, then there's no blessing on that. Because unity will give you peace. Disunity will cause you to be mad all the time. It, you, there's not a blessing there. And as we approach this topic this morning for just a few minutes, I'm going to give you five thoughts. And as we approach this topic uh, this morning, and talking about the third option, that we go into it with open eyes. Because some of you are sitting there today thinking you don't need this. And I'm here to tell you, you do need it. Amen? You got to let me pastor you a little bit because some people uh, in church everywhere think they already know all there is to know. And you think because you got a few black friends, then you're okay. Or you got a few white friends, you're okay. But the truth is we all need our eyes open. We all need to realize that we don't have revelation on everything. We, do, we think that because we see it the way we see it must be the only right way to see it, right? But we got to take those glasses off and put on a different set of glasses and realize there are different lenses to see things through. And in the body of Christ, because somebody sees something different than you see it, doesn't make them bad. Amen? Because they see something a different way than what you see it, too many times we have majored on the minors and minored on the majors. Amen? And we've got to recognize that like we sang about, it's Jesus that changes everything. And that's the end of my message that I'm preaching at the beginning of my message. But I just want you to go into it with eyes open. And, and I've done that and I've studied and I've read more and I've, and, and I've researched more and I've thought more and I've prayed more 
because I want to go into things with my eyes open and saying, Lord, give me revelation and teach me what I don't know. Because you don't know what you don't know. Because you think you know everything, but you don't know that you don't know everything. I'm preaching pretty good for a church that won't say amen right now. But thank you very much for me begging for amens. But it's okay. It's, it's all good. I'm not bitter at all. So number one. When we talk about the third option, let's just be real clear. We, we addressed this last week. He addressed it in the simulcast. But let me say it one more time. The third option is honor. Amen. The world today wants you to have to choose a side. You have to take sides. That's, see, that's the lens we wear. You know why? Because we hear that from culture. You have to, you have to choose a side. You have to be A or B. You have to be this or that. You, you have to be pro for or against. You can't, and, and we have allowed, as the, as the body of Christ in general, that thought to come into the church, that you have got to be one or the other. And I'm here to agree with Pastor McPherson that there is a third option that we as the church have to tell the world instead of the world telling us the way it has to be. Amen? This is, this, this is so key. The definition of honor is to give high respect or esteem or to regard with great respect. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, if we have that, if we could put that up, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 says this in the Christian Standard Bible, love on another one deeply as brothers and sisters. That's what Brother Ken said last week. We got to name people brothers and sisters. So we got to love on another one deeply, not shallow, deep. Everybody say deep. And then it says, outdo one another in showing honor. So you need to outdo. If somebody's showing you honor, you need to outdo them and show them even more honor. Amen. And then they're going to like, well, I, you're not going to outdo me. I'm going to outdo you. And then it's like, you know, pay it forward. You know, if somebody paid for your coffee at Starbucks, you pay for the guy behind you. Right? Outdo. Outdo. Everybody say outdo. The Bible tells us to outdo in honor, not outdo in opinion, not outdo in taking sides, not outdo one another and, and try to, see, we try to, we try to one-up them by telling them our opinion. Because if I post it, then it must be true. And if I put it out there, then I'm going to tell everybody what I think. And the truth is, you're not outdoing anybody except creating things that you don't want in your life and sowing things you don't want. I think we as a church need to sow honor like we've never seen. Amen. Is that true? Yes. Amen. So honor what we have in common. Honor those things. Make a decision. Go into this. And, and a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I think I show honor. Do it more. You don't know what you don't know. Do it even more. Just find somebody that doesn't look like you, doesn't uh, do the things you do. Or, you know, remember last week we talked about being an in group and being an out group. And if you miss that, you got to go back and get it or read the book, The Third Option, and find out that we all have an in group, but we all have an out group. And we got to show honor to the out group. And young people that are here, I want you to all listen. I'm glad you're in here today because. You're, you've got in groups at school and you've got out groups. And an out group is somebody that, that isn't, doesn't look like you. They don't sit with you at lunch. They're, I mean, we have, we have in groups here. If you're female, you're an in group right now. Why? Because you're just part of that group. That's it. I'm a male. I'm an out group from your in group. I'm not in that group. And I'm not confused about what group I'm supposed to be in. <laughs> I honor it, whatever, I, but Jesus changes everything, Amen. right? So, but you know what you got to do? You got you to show honor. That's right. Come on, Pastor. You got to show honor at your high school. Amen. You got to show respect. Amen. You young men, show respect to girls. Right. Show respect to females. Right. Learn that. Learn, learn that. Ladies, young ladies, show respect. Show honor. B, you're like, well, not every, you know, everybody's not like that. You don't understand my school. I know. I'm asking you to be the exception. Yeah. 
I'm saying you can be the difference maker. Just because everybody else is shunning all of those and, you know, they all, you know, those kids that eat by themselves and all that, and I don't, why don't you be the one that goes and sits by them? You know why? Because you got Jesus and they don't. So Jesus is the difference maker. Jesus is the one. When everybody else is shunning somebody or, or doing all that, then, then just go love on them. Just show them. You don't have to be like, oh, you know, just do something different. What if we just do something different? What if we just not do it like we've always done it? Instead of, and this, this covers lots of segments and lots of areas, but you know, st- don't, there are people that are hurting. There are people who, who man, you, you didn't live their life. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know how, why it turned out like it did. But let me, let me go on because I want to cover these points today and, and, and do it in a, in a right amount of time. So the third option is honor. Number two, unity is not easy, but it's necessary. These things we're talking about, it's not easy, young people, if I'm talking to you all, to go sit by the one that's eating lunch by themselves and just say hi to them. That's not easy. you got to get outside your comfort zone. Sometimes it's not easy to have those conversations and and, and do it without bitterness and do it without malice and just say, hey, I just, I want to hear your opinion on something. I want to hear what you think about it. And, And we don't have to agree to have unity. Here's what a couple of things Dr. Tony Evans talked about when he talked about uh, racial unity. He said, unity is not uniformity or sameness. It's not. We don't all have to think same. We don't have, oh, we don't all have to think the same. We don't have to vote the same. We don't have to cheer for the same team. We don't have to, to go to the same places. We don't have to have the same economic income. We don't have to have any of that to have unity. Amen. Amen. There, we've been given a mandate as, as a church to lead the fight, I believe, for unity in this city and to keep talking about it and get involved and do some things differently and, and be an example. This is so important to Jesus. Right before he went to the cross in John 17, he could have prayed, Lord, give me strength. Help me. Lord, uh, uh, help those that are going to come against me or do this or deliver me. Instead, in John 17, he prayed, Lord, I pray for these people, for the church, for the believers to walk in unity, for them to be one even as you and I are one. He prayed for unity because he knew if the enemy could slip in and divide, the enemy, the enemy feasts on this premise of divide and conquer. If I can divide them, I can conquer them. If I can get them majoring on minors, then I can conquer them. If I can do that, and we have taken that unity has to be that everybody looks the same, talks the same, cheers the same, all of that. And that is not what unity is. It's not everybody being the same. Jesus prayed that we would all be one. Dr. Evans said this, unity is not person-driven, it's purpose-driven. That we are all about the same purpose, that we believe together that we need to serve a city and, and, and people around us that are lost and going to hell. And that transcends whether they are black white, Latino, Asian, any nationality or any background, Jesus is the purpose for which we serve. Amen. Amen. Unity is built around that. We have to have clarity that we are uniting around Jesus. And then, even though you can't necessarily be yoked together with an unbeliever, you can have conversations with them. You can sit at lunch with them. In fact, you should sit at lunch with them. I heard a pastor in New York City has multiple services and things in his church, and he had a guy from another church come in to preach for him, and this guy's preaching all the services, and the guy that was preaching for him said, I came backstage after one of the services and the church's pastor is dressed in, he's changed clothes and he's dressed in basketball clothes and a NBA jersey and all of that and tennis shoes. And he's like, I'm thinking, okay, what did I miss here? Why are you doing an illustration in the next service? What's going on? And the pastor said, listen, um, 
they just got word to me that a guy I've been trying to reach, he's a drug dealer here in town. He's shooting hoops down at the park, just down the street from the church. He's like, you got this service, you take care of it. I'm going to go minister to that guy. Amen. And this pastor thought, oh my gosh, that's what you do between services? He said, you know, I get out of my comfort zone and have a latte in between services. And you know, he's like, I get out of my comfort zone. I'm shaking hands in the foyer going, oh, Jesus, this is, you know. He said, you're, you're going to play ball with a drug dealer. You know what? We just got to get out of our comfort zones. Many are trying to find unity from what culture tells us. But the enemy is after creating disunity by making little things the big things. And we focused on wrong things. We're, we got to unite about bringing the kingdom of God to, to our neighborhood, to our cities. We got to let the light of Jesus show brighter than we ever have. And we do that better when we're united. I read this week, uh, a few a couple of years ago, Lisa and I were out in California and we got to go to see some of the giant redwood trees and the huge sequoia trees and all of that out there in some of the forest. And I read that those trees, you would think these trees that are 300 feet tall uh, would have a really deep, deep root system. I mean, golly, how do they, how do they survive the storms? Uh, man, they got to have a deep root system. And the reality is they're not real deep at all. What they are is that they are spread out and their, their root systems wrap around each other and they're united together. And so they don't, they don't hold together because one of root goes real deep. They're united and they're strong because they're united. They're united. Now try to get me. Now try to get me. Storm, I don't care. Now try to get me. I may not be deep, but I'm wide. Because I'm united. That's how they get to grow so strong and withstand the storms. Amen. Number three. So first one, third option is honor. Number two, unity is not easy, but it's necessary. Number three, this ties into what Brother Ken said last week. We got to rename people. He said last week as brothers and sisters, that's true. Let me add another one. We got to rename people as your neighbor. You got to rename people as your neighbor. Look in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, cattle over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. It says, let us make man in our image. We are all created in the image of God. Amen. We are all created in the image of God. So when we start treating one another as our neighbors, as we start treating one another as people that are our neighbors, we don't, they don't have to look like us. They don't have to talk like us. They don't have to do any of those things. But we are all created in God's image. You young people at school, start treating people like they're God's image. Treat people like they're God's image. Don't wait for them to treat you right. You treat them right. Don't wait for everybody to do something for you. You go do something for them. Treat your parents like they're in God's image. Treat your friends. Treat your, them as neighbors. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 20. 2 and verse 37, Jesus said, you shall, here's the greatest commandment. He's like, you know, what, what, what are the great commandments? And here's what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Man, I want to love God first with all your soul and with all your mind. Verse 38 says, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You're to love God you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when you classify people as your neighbor, then you are given a command. You're given a command. Everybody say a command. 
We're given a command to love those people like we love ourselves. And I want to challenge us as Trinity, not just in these walls, but when we go out of these walls, when we go to the grocery store, when we go uh, to the restaurant, when we do those things that we're finding people that, and, and we're looking at them in the image of God and treating them as our neighbors. If we could pick, put up that picture of the neighbors holding that sign, if we could. Here's what it says. Some of you may have seen this. It says, love your neighbor. Everybody say, I'm going to love my neighbor. It says, love your neighbor who doesn't look like you. That's good. Anybody got some neighbors? They don't look like you? Love your neighbor who doesn't think like you. Anybody got some neighbors that don't think like you? Yeah. Love your neighbor who doesn't love like you. Why? They may not have Jesus. They don't love like you. Love your neighbor who doesn't speak like you. Love your neighbor who doesn't pray like you. And love your neighbor who doesn't vote like you. No exceptions. Love your neighbor, no exceptions. No exceptions. Everybody say, no exceptions. God's got to help us. Amen. Youth, love those that don't talk like you. Love those that don't look like you. Love those. Stand up for the ones that are being bullied in your, in your school. Stand up for those that are troubled. Stand up for the one that, that needs a friend. Be a friend to somebody that's not like you. Amen? Number four. Number four, be proactive and be intentional. Let's find ways. Next week, we're going to talk about this a little more. We need to find ways to serve one another and then go do it on purpose. We need to intentionally watch our words and our actions. Watch, watch the things, you, things you, that you say, things that you, you don't realize how it comes across. You, it's like, well, that's the way I was raised. We need, as the song, we, we need to get above our raisin sometimes. Amen? How were you raised that it created a certain attitude in you on any front? Leave behind divisiveness, negative words. Don't believe what the culture is telling us about choosing sides. Let's not believe that. Let's do something different. Amen? Amen. Realize you don't know somebody's story, nor do they know yours. You don't know where they came from. You don't know their background. I'm running out of time, but let me just, let me just say this. I... We, when I see pictures of um, around the world where there's refugee camps and people, you know, man, that breaks my heart to see little kids. You know, I think about my own kids here, my own grandkids. What if that, what if, what if that were, that's somebody's kid standing in a line to get a bowl of rice because they haven't eaten in two or three days. Man, that's hard. That's somebody's child. That's somebody's grandchild. And here's what I have started to realize. I, we, we're sitting in the United States of America. We're sitting in Louisville, Kentucky, you are dry on a rainy day. We are. If you came in and you got here at the right time, you probably got an usher, a parking lot usher to come out and help you in with an umbrella. You got a good life. Not perfect. I was born in Louisville, out on the south end. I won't go into all the details and things that our church stood for and, and back in the 60s and, and all the things that we, we had to stand against racial divisiveness back in the 60s on the south end. If you lived in Louisville, Dixie Highway was a racially divided area. And we were right in the middle of all that. And stuff happened. And, but then... I ended up moving to Miami, well, New York, and then Miami, and spent my junior high and senior high years in Miami, and, and raised by a single mom, and all of those things. You know, it's, uh, 
there are challenges to all that. But I wasn't raised in a refugee camp. I wasn't raised in poverty. We were, we were like middle class, middle, we were like in the middle of middle class. It just, it just, we were just white. We were just white middle class, you know? And probably when I was raised by a single mom, we were probably lower middle class as far as our income was, you know? We were buying our car tires on MasterCard and, you know, that was back when you probably get a tire for $30, but we didn't have $30. So we put it on MasterCard and, and paid it off. You know, my mom paid it off when she could and all of those things. My point is, and, and then I, that part of the, the story too, I just, I, I lived in a, in a, uh, south, in, in South Miami out in, in, it, all of Miami was becoming racially diverse at that time. But we traveled from South Miami to the school that I predominantly went to until my, almost my senior year of high school was in a very mixed race area. Uh, it was called the Alapata area. And if any of you uh, followed high school football back then. Our school was two blocks from Jackson High School, which was the predominant feeder to, for football to major colleges. And I would leave our little rinky-dink school and go stand at the fence of Jackson High School and watch them practice football because they were bad to the bone. But Jackson was a 90, maybe 100% African-American high school. And it was two blocks from my school, which was probably mixed African-American and Latino because at that time they had the Haitian boat thing coming over and, and Cuba uh, was sending over people. And, and I didn't speak much Spanish. My sister did, uh, but they had so that I could play basketball, Pablo uh, Jimenez had to teach me a little bit of Spanish so that the teams we could play, were playing, when they were calling out their plays in Spanish, I could understand them because that's who we played. We were right down from the 17th Street from uh, the Orange Bowl. We used to practice. I don't, I don't know if my... Yeah, there she is. Sandy, there. She graduated from Carroll City High School, and she, you'd be shocked. See, I went, I'm, I'm, I'm white, but I didn't grow up in that environment as far as school was concerned. We, we didn't have anything as a high school. We were poor. We were, we were a poor Christian school in the middle of this racially diverse thing. So we had to borrow other school stuff. And one of the things we had to borrow was a gymnasium and a baseball field. And if you've heard this story, forgive me. We used to travel from Mueller Christian School in this diverse area and would travel by van to Carroll City High School, which was, again, a predominantly black school. And they would let us use their baseball field, let us use their gym. And then if I got left there because of the van, I would ride the jitney from Liberty City back down to my school. There's a program out right now that LeBron James is producing called uh, talking about the Liberty City Warriors and how kids use football to get out of Liberty City. I didn't play football for, for Carol City. I, was never, I wasn't even close to being that good. I was bad. I was terrible. <laughs> but, but that's where we practice ball at. We use their gym. That's the environment that I grew up in. And it gave me a great appreciation that we all have struggles, some more than others. And, you know, for, for my Latino community, because it was racially diverse, you see, you know, everybody goes around now, goes to Starbucks and gets their little drinks. And, oh, I, I like drinking espresso. I was 12 drinking espresso <laughs> because there was a Cuban coffee shop and market you walked out the gate to Mueller, turned right, and went about 25, not, not even 50 yards, 25 yards, and there was a little corner Cuban coffee shop that because we didn't sleep, you know, like a teenager, you know, or we did sleep, I mean, we slept like three hours or something, and I would go, and we would get those little Cuban coffees before school started, and they came in the little Dimitas cups. You know, we didn't know what they were called, you know. Actually, they came in paper cups because we weren't rich enough to have Dimitov cups. And we'd sit there and go, you know, and throw back that espresso. 
Well, wait, you know what? I want one more. And we throw back another one. See, that was all that. We, we didn't even, you know, we didn't, we didn't speak Spanish. The guy just knew what we wanted because we thought if we said it in a Spanish accent, he would understand. <laughs> but I have, a, I have an espresso, please. What? You can't do that. It, you're 12. You can't drink espresso. It was, a, it was a racially diverse. It gave me an appreciation. It's why it's so much a part of this DNA of this house. Lastly, let me tell you this. You need to realize, I need to take about five minutes and tell you this. Can I have five minutes? Yes. This is maybe the most important part. You are who this word says you are. Second Corinthians chapter two and verse 14 says this. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Thanks be to God who leads us in triumph in Christ. The Bible gives one condition for the us, and that is to be a believer. That is to be in Christ. And if you will let me just teach this to you for just a minute. This is so key. This is why a couple of weeks ago, I told you this word teaches us character. It teaches us honor. It teaches us love. This, this word has to be predominant. But here's what I want you to get. I believe it is only this word that overcomes every single offense, every single thing that the world ever told you that you can't be something because this word overcomes it. This word overcomes it. Culture isn't going to overcome it. Political opinions aren't going to overcome it. All of those things that, we, that people fight about, that's not what overcomes. What overcomes is knowing that he has led us in triumph in Christ. That, that transcends being raised by a single mom. And people, you know, statistically, if you're raised by a single mom, man, you, you could be in trouble. Statistically, if you believe that, yeah. But the word gives us hope. The word, I, I, I could have been, God pulled me out of Miami, brought me up here, introduced me to this blonde chick the first night I was here. That's, that's the first night, first night I was in Louisville. I, I ran into her, I saw her. And less than a year later, we were married. Young, crazy, broke, stupid. But we did it anyway, you know, and, and statistics tell you, man, you get married that young, you ain't going to make it. I, I, I know, I know, but we had this, we had this. Pastor Winston teaches this far better than I can, but he, he has told the story countless times when he was there in Forest Park and they were trying to, to move their church to a larger location, and he was trying to buy a mall there, and he was going to put the church on one end and then have all these stores and pay him rent and all of that, and it was a rundown mall, and, and he was trying to, he was going to build it back up, and, but they had to go through a lot of permits and a lot of legal stuff and government regulations and approvals, and they came to Pastor Winston. Some, some friends of his came and said, Pastor, uh, you need to know something. That's, it, you're probably not going to get that mall. He said, why wouldn't I get it? He said, the city council, they don't want a black man to have that mall. And he looked at them and he said, what does that have to do with me? <laughs> he said, I'm a spirit man first. And if God says I can have it, it doesn't matter what city council says. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how the board votes. It doesn't matter if there's enough money. It doesn't make any difference because I'm a believer first. 
And when we take that, and that is the that is the cornerstone that gets left out of too many too many debates and too many arguments. That yes, I was raised by a single mom. Yes, I was this. Yes, I was. I, I didn't have this advantage, or I didn't have that advantage. But when I found Jesus, He took all the disadvantages. It doesn't mean you don't still fight. Of course, there's still a fight because we're fighting an enemy. They can't, they can't keep a believer down. Not when a believer takes his word. They can't keep black people from being billionaires. I heard an African-American man speak. I, I, the name of the company heard it up at, at the faith conference or when he was holding business conferences there. Had the largest computer wholesale business in, in the country. And he raised it up from nothing. And now he's the largest retailer of, of computer systems throughout the country. The company's worth about $6 billion now. And he talked about how his wife stood with him and all of that. And he said, when I was broke, he said, I couldn't get anybody to date me. He said, when you're worth $6 billion, he said, you got a lot of women interested. <laughs> but they couldn't keep him down. He, nah, he got hold of the word of God. That's true for all of us. It's, I, I can give excuses. I can tell you why I shouldn't make it. I can tell you this and that. And, and I get it. Things don't work out. Not everything's worked out. Not everything's perfect and all of that. But I know the God that I serve is causing me when I'm in Christ. He's going to lead me. He's going to lead the black man, the white man, the Latino man, the, the Mexican man, the Asian man, woman. You might be feeling well, you can't, you can't own that and be female. What does that have to do with you? You're a spirit woman first. And if God says you can have it, you can have it. You can take it. There is no male or female. There is no Jew nor Greek. In Christ, in Christ, it doesn't mean there's not struggle. That's what we're talking about. There is. There's, there's policies that have got to be redone and there's things that aren't right. And we got to stand for that and fight against it, it. and deal with it. it. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Let's stand up together. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. This overcomes any label somebody tried to put on you. You, and I had to decide this for myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a testimony, not a statistic. I'm going to show what God can do. I heard the story of Bill Clem. Bill Clem, back in the 20s, 30s, was called the father of all umpires. And he umpired baseball. And there was one game that was a tie game. And there was a close play at the plate where a runner was trying to score. And the runner had slid and dust is all around. And Bill Clem is standing there getting ready to make the call. And people are uh, the one side's coming out yelling, he's safe, he's safe. The other side comes running, you think there's going to be a big fist fight. The other side comes running, he's out, he's out. And they're screaming at each other. And Bill Clem steps in and he says, everybody, shut up. I have something to say about this and I will make the decision. I want to tell you, we got a heavenly father. We got Republicans screaming on one side. You got Democrats screaming on another. You got, you got economic people on one side, economic people on the other side. You got this group screaming, that group screaming. And, and, and the umpire, God, says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Everybody be quiet. I got something to say. When you're in Christ, Everybody wins. Everybody wins.
Father, have your way with us right now. Spirit of God, have your way with us. Father, we worship you. We want to hear what you have to say, Lord. Our opinions don't really matter. What matters is what does heaven say? And Lord, I thank you that we're going to love our neighbors. We're going to love our brothers and sisters. We're going to make a decision to live in unity. Lord, shake us up. Shake up the, the, the old thought patterns. Shake up the way we were raised. Lord, let, let the way we were raised not hold us back. Lord, we are going, we're, we're, it's a new day in Jesus Christ. One of our elders said he heard that in prayer this morning, that phrase, in Christ. In Christ. Brother Lamar I heard that today. In Christ. In Christ. I want to tell you today, you're in Christ. You're in Christ. If you're saved today, you're in Christ. You don't have to back off from anybody. When God tells you you're going to have something, when God tells you you can do something, when God tells you when you're a believer, anything is possible. Jesus, be Lord of this house. Lord, thank you for giving us wisdom. Thank you for giving us peace. Thank you, Lord God, for unity. And Lord, because we are making a decision for unity, the blessing of the Lord rests on this house. God, we got amazing things coming. We got amazing things happening. Spirit of God, have your way with us. Do a deep work on the inside. Lord, if wherever we've had uh, wrong opinions and, and wrong thoughts, and God, we lay that down and forgive us, God. We receive your forgiveness for those things. But Father, we are going to go out of our way to love everyone as our neighbor. From every walk of life, from every background, from every race, from every tribe. Lord, everything, Lord God. We are all in your image today. Help us to recognize that. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Teach us what we don't know. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you are so good. Your mercy endures forever. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. It is your word that overcomes everything. It is your word that overcomes everything. It is your word today that changes our heart. I think it was last week we talked about having a heart transplant. We need a heart transplant. Give us a, a heart after you, oh God. Give us a heart after our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's, let's declare this as a declaration of, of unity and the third option being honor. Let's make this declaration right now. Say this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I decree today. I make this declaration that I will walk in unity, that I will walk in honor, that I will recognize everyone as being in the image of God. I receive right now this word for my life. I will live a life that is honorable. I will do things right. I will look at everyone as being my brother and sister, as being my neighbor, and I will love my neighbor. I will learn what I don't know. I will get into an uncomfortable situation so that I can learn. Teach me, Lord. I won't just leave it here, but I believe with all of my heart that there is a third option. I don't have to take sides. I just have to let you take over. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for unity. Thank you for the blessing that comes because of unity. I receive it for my house. Every evil word that I have ever spoken, every negative word, that I have ever spoken about anyone 
about anything that's not like me. I repent of that and I let it go. I'll never do that again. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you cause us all to triumph in Christ Jesus. We win. We all win. We all win. We all win because of you, Jesus. We give you the praise. We give you the honor.